Tonight, we spoke about the holiday that made us Jewish. How did we become Jewish? What's our connection to God? Where did it start from? Find out now. So we are discussing the upcoming holiday of Shavuos, which some of you might never have heard of, or maybe only heard of once you started attending this class. And it's really interesting because Shavuos is considered, in a sense, the most special of all the holidays, meaning we have, of course, what we call the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And then we have three holidays are called the three pilgrimage holidays, the three times annually that the Jews have the obligation in the times of the temple to go to the temple to celebrate and be with God in the temple. The very, of course, known holiday of Passover and this one day holiday of Shavuot, in English, whatever it's called, Shavuot, Shavuot, and then the holiday of Sukkot or Sukkot. And most Jews have heard of Passover, and many Jews have heard of Sukkot or Sukkot, and many have not heard of Shavuos. It's like, you know, in between the two, there are weeks, it's one day. It seems like this very minor little holiday. It's, it's, it's shortly after Passover. You just did a big Jewish thing with Passover, you know, you're going to do a big Jewish thing six months later with the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, and like, and that's what we have. We have this like one day holiday, which of course in the diaspora is two days. Actually, from a certain perspective, Shavuos is the most significant and most special of all the holidays. And we're told that's why it's in the middle. Passover, Shavuos, Sukkot, or Shavuot and Sukkot. Why? It's like the central beam, the central beam of the structure. And that's why biblically it's one day. Again, outside of Israel, it's two days. But biblically, it's one day, just like Passover, biblically is seven, and outside of Israel is eight. And Sukkot, Sukkot, with the sort of addendum of another holiday that flows directly from it, biblically will be eight, and outside of Israel is nine. Shavuos, biblically, is one, and outside of Israel is two. Why is it biblically only one? Passover gets a week, Sukkot gets more than a week, and Shavuos gets one day? No, not because it's little and unimportant. The one symbolizes the oneness of God, the unity of God, higher than numeration, higher than division. Why is it so significant? Why is it the most significant? We became Jewish. That's when we became officially God's people. That's when we got the Torah. This holiday is the source of the other two. In the Torah that we received on Shavuos are the laws and holiday of Passover. In the Torah that we received on Shavuos is the laws and holiday of Sukkot, of Sukkot. So it's the source. This one or two day holiday is the source of Passover, is the source of Sukkot. <coughs> so it's the most special. But it's the shortest. And it doesn't require as much effort. Like Passover takes a long time to prepare. However you do it, there's a lot of work. Sukkot doesn't take as much work as Passover, but there's still, you're, you're building a sukkah, you're getting the four kinds, you're cooking for a lot of days, to go outside and eat. So it's, it's, it's more involved, it's more elaborate. Every night there's dancing on the streets and this hakaf bolt around the Torah. There's a lot going on in Sukkot. So it also takes up a lot of space, makes a lot of noise. And Shavuos seems like a more minor, shorter, and easier holiday. So we want to shine a light this week and next week on Shavuos. And again, it's the holiday that made us Jewish. It's when we became Jewish. It's when we became God's people. So I thought that would be the first good point to really focus on is how has your being Jewish changed your life? Because Shavuos is when you became Jewish. We're all there. Of course, every single Jew that ever was or will be was there by the giving of the Torah, by God making us his people. But we are a reincarnation of that generation that left Egypt. So we weren't only there as souls that came down to participate. We were souls in body. We were that right, those righteous women that got us out. And that's when we became God's people. That's when we became Jewish. And that's changed our destiny ever since. So how, how has being Jewish change the trajectory of your life? Maybe it's a hard question to answer because you can't even like, what does that mean? What would my life be if I wasn't Jewish? Yeah. On the other really? hand, you, you lived in a time when maybe you didn't know you were Jewish or maybe you weren't allowed to really know about being Jewish. So maybe you did experience that shift of a life without knowing you're Jewish or knowing what Jewish means and a life when you do know what Jewish means. Rachel? I just wanted to say that 
we always were Jewish. I, I always knew that I was Jewish, so it never changed for me. Always, there was there was never, it's, it's hard to envision life not being Jewish because you always knew you were Jewish and had that sense of being I Jewish. I think I always, although my parents didn't do much, but my grandfather did and maybe they talked about it, but I, I always so knew. So you always had an awareness. Yeah. So has anyone here actually not like truly did not know you were Jewish or you knew you were Jewish, but you didn't know what the word meant. All you knew maybe was that it was not a very positive thing. <laughs> it was sort of derogatory or created some resentment or distaste on other people toward you, but you didn't know what it really meant. And then anyone had that experience and then they maybe the Soviet Union opened up a bit or maybe they left and then they found out some other things that being Jewish mean so they could see the difference. Um, I always knew I was Jewish, but then already later in life, something happened and I realized that I was only Jewish mm -hmm. kind of like on empty calories because without Torah, you can't, Without Torah, it's not really enough. I, I mean, just to consider yourself Jewish, and it would somebody would say to me, "Are you really Jewish?" Oh, yes, but I wasn't belonging. I wasn't belonging to Jewish people until I started um, learning Torah and doing mitzvot. Only then I really felt that I arrived, that I am home, that I belong to Jewish people truly. And how did you see that change your life? How it changed my life? I have to tell you, the first year when I started, uh, that I started doing mitzvot, this whole year, I, I really felt euphoria. <laughs> so I funny. was like, I felt euphoria. I, um, and then it subsided, um, subsided, and, and you know, when you think you have to, you have to develop, work on the muscle. You have to work on the muscle constantly, constantly to work on the muscle. But for me, when I accepted, what are those mitzvot hukos? Okay, for me, that was like Hava said last time, without logic, remember? So to me, that was the biggest hurdle to do, um, to accept hukos because we learned in secular world, if you don't understand it, you shouldn't do it. Remember how it, it says in, in secular world? And then I, I was thinking, if I do it, if I don't and don't understand it, then it'll be I'll be like a hypocrite. And so that was the biggest hurdle for me to get over to to finally understand that uh, I can trust Hashem. He knows better. For me, I, I don't have to understand it. I just have to trust Hashem. Just like my child can trust me on certain things. And and that result is the biggest thing for me to do mitzvot. That's beautiful. And yeah, I can understand when you have a certain training, like you're saying, what, I'm a hypocrite. How could I do this? It's not rational until I, you know, I, 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 yes. And then just gradually, gradually, like drop by drop, like Rabbi Akiva's rock, drop by drop, the truth of Torah, the godliness of Torah penetrates and we shift and we look at the world a little differently. Now I can say for myself, and I was raised Jewish and I was raised Orthodox. And um, so thank God I was fortunate to always be in an Orthodox environment my entire life. My parents are Orthodox, my family is Orthodox, my siblings. But I remember when I went to seminary, which is something in the Orthodox uh, school road for women, for girls, after high school, before college and university, if you're going to go on, you take a year or two and further your Jewish study. And I went to Israel and I studied there for two years. And when I first went to Israel, I would say sort of like what Rivka is saying, and here I'm coming from a completely Orthodox background. I was Orthodox religious my entire life, but like when I was there and I was studying the inner dimension of Torah, Hasidus, real, now I, I was raised in a Lubavitch home. So I always had that identity, but I didn't have the knowledge. And when I started studying, I, I think I, I maybe achieved Rivka's euphora. 
I felt, I, I will express it like I felt like a, a fire got turned on inside of me. I felt like a certain fire, a certain flame, a certain passion. God just became so real, so intently there in my life in such an amazing, beautiful way that, thank God, has continued. And definitely, with, to me, I would say that totally changed the, everything about my life because it totally, once, once God is so real, Everything in your life is working around your relationship with God and exists vis-a-vis -vis your relationship with God. So it's a, it's a different life, different when you really feel him. So in Israel, as we said, it's a one-day holiday, biblically. Outside of Israel, it's two days. It's this year, it comes up starting on a Thursday night, May 25th, which means not this Thursday night, but next Thursday night. That's why we have two classes. We can talk about it. Thursday night through Saturday night. So it's Thursday night. Friday, and then Friday night, Saturday. We light the first candles Thursday night at 7.55 with a blessing for the holiday. And the next night is Friday night. So the candles are lit 7.54. And when we light that candles, we make a special blessing that I'll post by before the holiday, which is a blessing that combines bringing in the Sabbath and bringing in the holiday, as well as, of course, the special Shekhyanu blessing for the holiday. On the second day, which means Friday, we only light from a pre-existing flame, meaning Thursday is a regular weekday Thursday. You can go to work, you can cook, you can clean, you can probably work quite hard preparing for the holiday. Thursday before 7.55, or it might be 7.53, I'd have to actually check for you. You can light a match and make the two blessings that we make traditionally on the holiday and the special Shekhi and the blessing whenever there's a holiday. The next day, Friday, there's a holiday. The next day, Friday, when we're going to now make a blessing that combines the Sabbath and the holiday and then the Shekhi and the blessing, we cannot just strike a match because on a holiday, we're not allowed to make a new fire we can only use from a pre-existing flame. So how are you gonna have a pre-existing flame? And I know if you've ever gotten my messages about candle lighting, you always see that term pre-existing flame. This is why, because we don't just strike a match on a holiday. You can create fire, but from a ready existent fire. So basically you have two choices. One option is you can keep a little flame on your range, depending on how hot it is outside. You might or might not want to keep a flame burning for 48 hours. If you don't want to keep the flame burning for 48 hours, on Thursday before the holiday begins, light what we call a yisker light. Light a 24 hour candle, or even better light a 48 hour candle. So for sure it won't be a problem, it'll be easier to light from. And that candle will just be one candle, so it won't be a whole fire and it will burn. So before the Sabbath, on Friday, close to eight o'clock, a candle will still be burning and you could put your candle or map into that candle and get a light. Now, if you do it that way, you wanna put it in very carefully because if you don't put it in carefully, you're gonna extinguish your candle and have a problem. If you have a flame on your range, you're not gonna extinguish it so you don't have that issue. Besides this 24 or 48 hour candle that you might have burning, so you have a source of fire to light your candles Friday, you also, before you light the candle for the Sabbath and the second day of holiday, you want to light a Yisker candle because on Shabbos is Yis Yisker is the memorial service for the departed. On every holiday, on Yom Kippur, on the last day of Passover, on the last day of Shavuot, and on the second to last day of Sukkot, because the last day has so much going on in it and people drink a lot, so it might not be appropriate. On those four times a year, we have a special ceremony to remember the departed. And we want, basically, the purpose of the ceremony is twofold. One, we want to give them the blessing of the holiday. I mean, they're souls above. They can't do for themselves. So who's supposed to do for them? Us. So if someone passed away that you love and you want them to have the blessing of the holiday, you saying this prayer and pledging that after the holiday, you'll give charity in their honor, gives them the blessing and the elevation that we're enjoying down here, that our souls are enjoying, they enjoy above because of your prayers and your dedication to charity that you will give Saturday night after the holiday is over. We do not give charity on a holiday. It's just like Sabbath. We don't touch money. So we do not give charity on the holiday. Do not give charity on Saturday. Give it Saturday night when the holiday is over. The second idea in the Yisker Memorial Prayer 
is to draw down the blessings from the departed on us. They're above, hopefully they were good people that can pull strings above. By us mentioning them and turning to them, it's also for them to help us or maybe to help someone else. Maybe if a parent of yours passed away and it's not for you, but it's for a child, a grandchild, a spouse, there could be people in the world that you're asking them to bring down blessings for. So in the memorial prayer, which we say as a synagogue four times, and we actually say it covertly on Rosh Hashanah as well. So we really say it five times a year covertly on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, on the last day of Passover, on the last day of Shavuot, which this year is Shabbos, and on the second to last day of Sukkot, those five times a year, we are sending them the blessings and spiritual benefits of the holiday. And we are also turning to them that they should bring down blessings for us or for other people in our lives. Now, if someone just passed away for the first year after someone passes away, we stay in synagogue, but we do not say the prayer. We only say the prayer if it's already been a year. The reason we don't say the prayer the first year is because in general, we try not to disturb the soul. In the first year after a person passes away, they're busy ascending, detaching from this world, cleansing, purifying, and ascending. So we don't want to bother them. But after the first year, we do say the prayer to help them and to bother them and bring down for us blessings. So on Friday, not Friday night, once the Sabbath has come, on Friday before 7.50, to give yourself safe time, light a candle, a Yisker candle, a memorial candle for each person you would like to honor that way, which of course, we're beginning with a parent, and then anyone else in your world that you want to help. Similarly, if you stay in synagogue for the memorial prayer, which would only mean in front of your parents has passed away, once you're already saying the Yisker prayer, you can say it for anyone. You keep saying the prayer with inserting the name. So it could be a friend of yours, a spouse, a child, cousin, an uncle, an aunt, anyone in your world that has departed, you can pray for to help them and bring down blessings from them as long as already you are supposed to say the prayer for at least one of your parents. If both of your parents are alive, you do not say the prayer. If you're in synagogue, you actually do not stay in synagogue. If you have both of your parents alive, you leave the synagogue for the prayer. If you are not going to synagogue, a week from Saturday on the second day of the Shavuos holiday, you can still say the prayer at home. Some people feel, oh, I only, only can say it in synagogue. That is not true, that is false. You can say the prayer at home. Of course, you prefer to say it in a synagogue, but you can say the prayer at home. And it definitely, if either one of your parents have passed away, you definitely wanna say the prayer for them. And as you're saying the prayer for each person you're saying it for, you pledge in your heart charity that you will give after the holiday is over. You give charity per the number of people. Though of course you could give different denominations if you wanted. If you would say, say you're saying it for your parent and a friend and a cousin, you might want to give more for the parent. But for each person that you say the prayer for, you give a certain amount of charity. So the prayer plus the charity is what helps the, these souls also benefit from the holiday and also bring down the blessings for us. Just one more technical note I wanted to make and then any technical questions on the holiday and then we'll speak of the spirituality. This holiday, now it's not true every holiday, but it comes out often enough. We also had this Passover this year. We have to make something called an Eruv Tafshilin. An Eruv Tafshilin is a very simple ceremony we do before the holiday starts, meaning this year you would do it on Thursday before you light your candles. It's in the prayer book, explains exactly how. You take a, something baked like a matzah or a challah, and you take some cooked dish like a boiled egg or a piece of fish or a piece of chicken or meat, and you can read in the prayer book what you do with it, lift it up, give it to someone, say a blessing. The purpose of this is to allow you on Friday to light the candles for the holiday, warm up food, so you should have hot food for the Sabbath, second day of holiday, cook for the Sabbath, second day of holiday, because technically we do not prepare from one day of the holiday to another. Meaning, let's say forget about 
Sabbath. I'm going to put it out of the picture just to understand the concept. Let's say Shavuot came out this year on Tuesday, Wednesday, which it doesn't. I do not want to confuse anyone. I just want to teach this rule, this law, which comes up many times with holidays. If Shavuot came out Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're having a huge crowd Wednesday, don't ask me why, you invited everyone and their second cousin. So Tuesday afternoon, you know, it's a long day. You want to start making salads for your meal Wednesday, for your meal Tuesday night, which is already the second day of the holiday, Tuesday night, Wednesday. Not allowed to. You're not allowed to do anything to prepare for that second day, which means second night and day, until it begins. So even though you have hours Tuesday and your whole crowd is coming like 40 minutes after Tuesday night starts, sorry, you cannot do anything until the next day has come, which means it's the next night. I hope that was clear. Again, in our mythical example, the holiday started Monday night. It was Tuesday and Wednesday. So the first day of the holiday is Monday night, Tuesday. The second day of the holiday is Tuesday night, Wednesday. You're having a huge meal Tuesday night. Nothing you can do about the entire Tuesday. You have to wait until it's Tuesday night. Why? Because you can't prepare from one day to the next. So if we kept that rule, we'd have a big problem Sabbath because we can't prepare. So we can't light the candles and we can't make the food hot and we can't cook. So what do we do? So this is an enactment of the sages called Erev Tafshilin. If you forget, you can rely that someone else you live in a city like Chicago, there's another Jew that made it. And when you make it, you make it and have all the Jews in your city in mind. So you can rely that someone else did it, but ideally you make it yourself. For the same reason that technically we cannot prepare from one day of the holiday to the next, if you are keeping food hot, the second day of Shavuos, which this year is Sabbath, you must make sure all your food is cooked and all your food is hot and hour before the Sabbath, second day of holiday begins, which means approximately seven o'clock. We're gonna light the candles a little before eight, like 7.53, I believe, 7.54. So by seven o'clock, 10 to seven, seven o'clock, all the food has to be cooked. All the food you're having hot on the Sabbath must be hot. You cannot, well, I've got 15 minutes till the Sabbath. No, nope. uh, plenty of time to warm up the food. No, it, for technical reasons that I could try to explain or you don't need me to explain, but all the food has to be ready to be eaten hot, to be able to be served to someone about an hour before the holiday, the Sabbath begins. Okay, those are the technical details I wanted to mention. Does anyone have any questions on anything technical having to do with the holiday? All right, I hope that means everything was super clear. Um, and you're very knowledgeable and you've learned this so many times and it's all a complete easy piece of cake. Beautiful. So now let's talk about some of the spirituality. We have time now, 15 minutes, and we will continue next week. We really want to understand this holiday because this is, we're saying, the most significant holiday. This is the holiday that made us Jewish. This is the holiday that gave us the Torah. We want to understand it. So again, this is one of the three holidays that are biblical. In the times of the temple, it was an obligation on all the Jews to go to the temple, three times a year. It's interesting, Yom Kippur does not have that obligation, even though of course the Jews also went on Yom Kippur, but Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot, or Shavuot and Sukkot, there was an obligation, men, women, and children to go to the temple to celebrate with God. Every holiday has its forte, its specialness. Sukkot, Sukkot gives us joy for an entire year. Passover gives us liberation for an entire year. And Shavuot, Shavuot gave us the Torah. And every year again, God is giving us the Torah, which means on a practical level, it is very important to go to synagogue Friday. Friday does not mean this Friday. Friday means next Friday. I think that's like May 26th or something like that to go to synagogue, to be there when they read in the Torah, the 10 commandments, we are told that when you are in synagogue and they are reading the Ten Commandments, you are getting the Torah one more time. Time, I think it's like 3,325. You are getting the Torah one more time and God's giving it from a deeper place, from a more intimate place, from a higher place than he ever gave it before. Now, again, we were there 3,300 some years ago, but this year, even though we're not standing at the foot of a mountain, even though we hear the thunder and see the light and all that stuff, but we are actually getting a deeper level of Torah than we got then. God is literally giving us more now than he gave us then. So we want to be there and get it. We want to be there 
to get this. We want to be there a week from this Friday. Find out with the closest synagogue to you when they will do the Torah reading and be there for that Torah reading. If you live near a Chabad house, they might have multiple readings. They might have a reading later in the afternoon when it's more convenient for people when they're home from work. But make sure if it's in the morning, if it's in the afternoon, you're there. Now, as I said, Saturday, the Sabbath, the second day of the holiday is the memorial prayer. And a lot of people want to be in synagogue then, and that's beautiful. But you can say it from home. But getting the Ten Commandments, you can't do that from home. You really, really, really need to be in synagogue. And just as God is giving us his Torah, his Torah means his will, his wisdom, We want to show him we appreciate it. So we want to renew our commitment to Torah by dedicating ourselves to learning Torah over the Shavuos holiday. It's 48 hours. Thursday night, sorry, yes, Thursday night. Thursday night, Friday, Saturday. 48 hours plus, plus an hour. So 49 hours you want to spend as much time as you can. And hopefully over 49 hours, there is time to study Torah. Maybe it's easier for you this year that it comes out on a Saturday, Friday and Saturday, because maybe Saturday you have time that you wouldn't have on a regular day of the week. You want to study Torah because it's like, imagine if I gave you something so precious and you're like, thanks. And then like you put it in a drawer and never open it up. I mean, maybe some of you have had that experience because your parents and maybe you gave your daughter something that was so valuable to you and you could see the way she said thanks, she doesn't really care about it. Or maybe you've given a grandchild something that was so meaningful, that has so much memory, that, that maybe was from your parent or your grandparent, and it was so special to you giving it on and they're like, oh, thanks. You could have given them a tablet, you know, they would appreciate that more. So that happens to us sometimes. Or if it didn't happen ever in your life, that's nice, but you can imagine it happening. So imagine how God feels when he's giving his self. The Torah is his thoughts, his inner will, his inner desire. And he's giving it to us. And we're like, thanks. And we don't bother looking at it. Oh, we're keeping the holiday. Maybe we're having the meals. Maybe we're having company. Maybe we're having good food. Maybe we're having lots of dairy that we might speak about today or next week. We're celebrating. We go to synagogue. We're praying but we don't even unwrap the present. We don't even dust it off to look at it. That's, I imagine that's really hurtful. So on the holiday, when God is recommitting to us, is giving us himself, is giving us his Torah, is giving us that which made us his people, Jewish. We want to take the time and study. And we're told that the evil inclination that generally tries to block us from doing good things, including studying Torah, because that's a good thing that God wants, is inoperative for the 49 hours of the holiday. It can bother you in other areas. The evil inclination might get you to gossip. It might tempt you to desecrate the holiday. It can bother you. But it's not going to bother you to not learn. If you don't learn, it's just your fault. It's just you. You can't even blame it on your evil inclination. Just as we're told, Rosh Hashanah, the evil inclination cannot bother us during the blowing of the shofar. Or on Yom Kippur, the entire 25 hours plus of Yom Kippur, the evil inclination does not bother us to sin. You could say, hmm, I think I've sinned some years on Yom Kippur. Maybe, but that was you. Meaning you weren't inspired to sin, enticed to sin, incited to sin by your evil inclination. You just did it yourself without any push. So similarly, on the Shavuos holiday, no evil inclination is blocking you, is fighting you, is putting up a big difficulty to study. You might not study because I study, I don't know. I ate, now I'm tired, now I'm going to sleep, now I'm going to take a walk, now I'm going to talk to people. I'm distracted, I'm doing other things, but the evil inclination is not bothering you, which means we really, really have a greater ability than we normally do to really commit to learning. So there's really two levels of the learning on Shavuos. One is on Shavuos itself to learn, and two is to make a commitment, a deeper commitment to learn 
in the coming year. Anyone have any ideas of the commitment they would want to make to God of the learning in the coming year, how they could commit more to God and give God more learning? Because again, he's giving us himself. Hopefully we appreciate that. We show our appreciation by valuing it, by learning. And the commitment could be whatever you're doing to do more focused, meaning there's two levels of focus when we study, having a fixed time and they're fixing it in our soul. Having a fixed time means it's considered very valuable, like for the women that attend this class regularly, Monday nights, eight o'clock, you learn. That's a fixed time in your life. That's very good. And you might attend other classes that have certain time, certain day, and that's when you're learning. That's called fixed in time. Or maybe like when you have time, you open up a book. That's good too. God appreciates it. But it's even better if the time was fixed. I do it in the morning with my coffee. I do it at night before I go to sleep. I do it when I come home from work, before I eat supper. A fixed time helps the study process. And there's also something called being fixed in your soul, which means as you're studying to really try to take it all in. It's not just like, yeah, you're reading, it's nice, it's cool, it's interesting, it's exciting, it's, it's uh, inspirational, it opens up your mind to some ideas. Deeper than that, to really try to like ingest it, to really try to internalize it, to really try to make it your own. And that's like fixing it in your soul. So why am I saying this? Because maybe you could decide that you're going to learn more that there's some things you don't know that you'd like to study over the year, something in Jewish law or something in scriptures and Tanakh or something in Talmud or something in Midrash, something in Hasidus and Tanya. There's prophets, so much to learn. Or it could be that you do learn, but you might want to make it fixed with a certain time. Or you might have even a time and you want to make it fixed to commit to like trying to really Get it into your soul. And those are all different ways you could commit and show God, I really appreciate it. And again, definitely on the Shavuos holiday itself, you want to really show God you appreciate it and really make sure you study. All of this is we're talking about is something happening in about two weeks. Not this Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, next Thursday night, Friday, Saturday. I'll focus this as a last point. Well, two points of what we really need to do before the Shavuos. We want to reflect on what the Jews said to God, the saying that we said 3,300 some years ago to God when he asked us if we wanted. And we said then two Hebrew words. I'll say it in Hebrew, then I'll say it in English. Na'aseh v'nishma. Na'aseh v'nishma means we will do and then we will listen, we will hear, we will understand. So what the Jews were saying to God was, we're going to do, we're accepting the Torah, and then we're going to understand what precisely it is that you're giving us. Sometime before Shavuos is worthwhile reflecting on this concept because that's what made God say, yeah, yeah, you're telling me that? It's yours. Na'aseh v'nishma. I'm giving you my tone. But what, what do you think this means for you today? This idea of we will do and then we will understand. Any thoughts on that? It was complete trust in God knowing that we will take it because uh, we'll understand it later. But whatever God gives, it's all good. I was actually thinking of what Rivka was saying before. How this in my mind related to what Rivka was saying. How it was very hard for her to do those pieces that God asked that didn't make any sense to her that she didn't understand. And it was a big transition that she felt in herself to come to serve God in ways that rationally didn't make sense to her. And that is a big piece of this na'aseh v'nishma, we will do and then we will understand. Of course, as Rivka's saying, and it's true, it's a total leap of faith. When the Jews said that, they didn't know what God was gonna ask from them. They had no clue. And they were saying, God, we're yours. What you want, we're doing. No questions asked. And then once we're already committed and we're already doing, we'll try to understand. 
as much as our human minds can understand. But if we understand or not, we are committing, we are yours, we are serving you. And, and I think this has a lot of modern day implication for us because again, just as Rivka described her own journey, we all have those pieces of like where it maybe doesn't make sense to you. You don't know enough, you haven't learned enough, or even if you do have learned a lot and know a lot and it still doesn't, you don't understand it. Still hard for you to process it. It's still hard to fathom it. And that's that space, that's that space of we will do and then we will understand. And often as you do, the understanding comes. Meaning when you do those things that you don't understand, as you do them, something inside of you opens up and it's easier and easier to understand. Them. So that's one thing that I wanted to already mention, Shay. Rachel, did you want to add something? I just wanted to say that for us, it's easier because when they received Torah, they were first generation. It was harder for them to say, we will do and then understand. We know that for thousands of years, Jews already have been doing it. So it's like we trust it more. <laughs> You're absolutely that. correct. hundred percent. I was thinking that also when we, because that was us in a previous lifetime, when we said to God, we will do, and then we'll understand, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We had no clue what God was going to ask of us. And we still committed to him out of love for him, out of belief in him, as Rifka said, with trust in him, that he's not going to ask us anything that we shouldn't be doing. As Ruffel says, we do know what he wants. And we've been living this life for thousands of years. We know it's a good life. We know it's the best life. We can trust this life. But we still really do, and the Bob Jerba emphasized this point. Each one of us has to make this commitment to God. This commitment of yes, I'm yours. Yes, even those pieces that I don't understand yet, I'm doing, and then I'll work on the understanding. Something else, and I just I'm going to mention this already now, and this is specifically really focusing on this coming Shab Sabbath, this coming Shabbos is really a time for this. Another prerequisite for receiving the Torah is unity among the Jewish people. When the Jews came to the area where the Torah was being given, which was on the first day of the month of Sivan, they received the Torah six days later. It says, and he camped by the mountain. He was talking about three million people. And the Torah says, and he, in the singular, camped by the foot of the mountain because the Jews were so united, like one man with one heart, they were so fused. Only time in our history we achieved that, like one man with one heart. And again, to reenact and recreate and have that same merit prerequisite for receiving God's Torah is unity, is brotherhood, is love. So it's really a very, very, very special time to make up with people, to create loving feelings, to ask yourself again, this is time 3,335, 3,335 times. God is one more time giving us his Torah, his will, his wisdom, his self, and the best magnet, the best anchor, the best catalyst for him to give it down to us is unity and love among us. So to think if there's anybody in your world, anybody in your world that you need to do some repair work, relationship repair work, digging deeper in yourself, pulling out more love, more understanding, more tolerance, more compassion, God time three, 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 five is giving us himself from a deeper level than ever before. It's nice from our level, from our end to be coming to greet him. And we come to greet him with this inner acceptance of we will do and then we'll understand. And with this deepening of the unity and love between his children. Because as we can, as we can all relate to, what gives a mother more joy than seeing her children getting along? So when God sees us getting along, like one man with one heart, he's like, yes, the time has come for you to be my people. The time has come for me to give you my Torah. And when we reenacting this, try each one of us to 
try to be a little more like one man with one heart, it gives God a lot of joy. Just like when we see our children getting along better, it gives us a lot of joy as well. So those are the two.